Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Lunch and Win the Experts, the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation program brought to you by Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. My name is Rain Bennett. I am your host this week and every week, and I'm a filmmaker and a writer, uh, and I've been working with CCF for a long time now, 10 to 12 years, I think, in fact. And we've, you know, over that time, we've created... Uh, honestly, I think thousands of videos, definitely hundreds of videos, um, but, uh, you know, documentaries, we've done lots of video series or live video series like the one you're going to watch today, very dense treatment based videos, but all with the same mission in mind, and that is to educate people and spread awareness about neuroendocrine tumors. That is what we are here to do today. Now, this show in particular, I think the value is twofold. I think we have the information that you're going to get and the answers to your questions from our guests today, but also the community, the shared experiences of the community. This community is so strong, so supportive. If you are new to this journey, I highly encourage you to reach out to them, introduce yourself. They will embrace you. And if you look at the comment section, you already see people chiming in and saying hello, letting us know where they're signing on from. I encourage you to do the same thing because I, I personally, and I think the community does too, really gets get excited about seeing how far this program uh, reaches. Um, and, and, and every week, inevitably, we have people from all over the world tuning in live, which is very impressive to me. Uh, so I see AJ from uh, Nepal already, Alabama, San Jose, Canada, as always, Jeans and Smith Mountain Lake. That's uh, you are not where you normally are, but that's nice to see that. I know Smith Mountain Lake. That sounds like you're having a fun time. Okay, so before we really get started with the show, we want to thank our sponsors, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. Without their support, we wouldn't be able to do the show. But we have this disclaimer from them, and that is that the opinions expressed by our guest presenter today, as well as the questions asked by the audience that you all at home haven't been created or suggest suggested ahead of times by the sponsors of Lunch with the Experts. And CCF doesn't endorse or promote any of the views, op opinions, or information uh, provided in the presentation. So here's the here's the takeaway. Audience members should not rely solely on the opinions or information expressed by the guests today and should seek guidance and direction from their own medical advisors regarding any choices they make about their health or treatments. OK, that's a lot of words. But the point is, we don't know your specific case. Our guest does not know your specific case. So we're going to give you some good general advice some good answers to your question. But by all means, take that advice and those answers back to your home team, which does know your specific case and make the best plan and path forward for you, because um, I was talking with our guest before we started and 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 uh, he was kind enough to be kind of surprised that I wasn't a medical expert, at least having this position. But one thing that I have learned about this disease in 10 years of not being an expert, but learning about it is that each case is unique and therefore each path forward is as well. So really important for you all to understand that before before we move forward. Now, I alluded to our guest. Now it's time to officially uh, introduce him, which is his first time on the show. I'm very excited. And he has done his homework. He's watched multiple episodes um, he's already, he's already complimented me and may, you know, boosted my ego a little bit. So we're, we're good friends already. <laughs> Dr. Basam Sonbo. How are you, Dr. Sonbo? Very good. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. We're, it's a pleasure to have you. Now, uh, we talked a little bit before we started recording about your team and the, and a lot of the team that has been on the show. For those who aren't familiar with you, where you work, what you do, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and the role that you fill in this, in this net community. Yeah. Um, well, thank you again for the introduction and uh, thanks for all the listeners. Um, so I'm one of uh, five GI medical oncologists here at Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And each one of us has kind of a specific interest and then kind of secondary interest. All of us, we see only gastrointestinal cancers. So mm -hmm. my main focus is really uh, neuroendocrine tumors and upper GI cancers. So gastric and esophageal cancers. But neuroendocrine, I would say, constitute more than 60% of my practice. Okay. Um, and uh, so I'm a medical oncologist, not a surgeon. You don't want me to operate on you and <laughs> anyone. But uh, I kind of work with really great team of surgeons, uh, pathologists, radiation oncologists, cardio oncologists. So doctors with the kind of interest of carcinoid heart disease, uh, radiation oncologists, nuclear medicine, and others. Uh, along with dietitian and, and uh, psychologists, integrative medicine, that's all in here in Mayo Clinic, Arizona. And then in addition to that, uh, you know, Mayo Clinic uh, Cancer Center is considered one cancer center. And actually, we all believe in that. So that because of that, we do have very strong relationship and collaboration with our colleagues and uh, the other two Mayo sites. So Mayo Clinic in Rochester, where we have uh, kind of the 
medical oncologist over there is Dr. Thorhav Dannerson and Dr. Tim Habde. And then the other uh, uh, site is uh, Mayo Clinic Florida and Dr. Jason Starr is, is my uh, friend and collaborator over there. So we all work really uh, together in order to serve our patients. Um, uh, like one of the examples of collaboration, we have our monthly meeting uh, where we discuss, uh, you know, clinical case like a tumor board in a monthly fashion. In addition to that, we have our local tumor boards to kind of discuss with patients and things like that. Um, more about me that I've, I've been, I joined Mayo Clinic in 2016. That's where I did uh, my fellowship and I finished my fellowship in 2019. Throughout those three years between 2016 and 2019, I developed the interest in GI cancers and specifically neuroendocrine tumors. And I've been uh, as a faculty here at Mayo Clinic Arizona since 2019 and uh, really enjoying uh, working with the team uh, here and, and taking care of the patients. Awesome, awesome. Well, we appreciate you being here. Uh, folks, I want to send a special shout out to a couple of people in the audience I see today. Belinda, hello from Raleigh, NC. Belinda, I'm right next door in Durham. Isn't that amazing? And I think this is the first time I'm seeing your name. So if, if that's true, uh, welcome to the show. And then Karen from Australia. So just as I said, people from all over the world tuning in, I, lo I love to see it. Now, <clears throat> Dr. Sonbo uh, referenced or referred to Dr. Starr um, down in uh, in Florida, and I just wanted to make mention, I talked earlier about all the videos that I've I've created with CCF over the past decade, and right now, I just want to want to let you all know this, because it starts next month. We are doing another patient-centric documentary series. The last one we did was in 2018. It was award-winning, got lots of uh, 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 views. And we did 12 of those, and I think we we're doing five or six this year. And the first one is coming out in August, and it's featuring Eileen Bildman, who is Dr. Starr's patient, which is why I bring that up. And she is a Ferrari race car driver at like 65 years old and a net patient. I'm telling you, you are going to want to see this documentary. It's amazing. So, And she is, is amazing. And so uh, I think there will be a lot of inspiration in that one. So just a plug for that. But she mentions Dr. Starr in the in the. Uh, in the film and so he's 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 a good friend of the show and uh and a great doctor as well um so folks a little bit more housekeeping before we get started i mentioned that we have all this this video content this database this library for you i encourage you to utilize that if your question doesn't get answered today we're going to have that answer somewhere in all the videos that we've created but you can also follow it with ccf um, at carsonoid.org, their website or just here on the facebook page you can send them a private message we're going to try our best to get to every question but we get hundreds sometimes at each episode so inevitably we don't here's a couple of things that will help me get your question answered one as i alluded to earlier we don't know your specific case so all these super specific details to your case uh doesn't really help so try to formulate your question in a general way like so we can get you down you know down your journey the next step okay we're not going to be able to solve everything for you today we want to help you and then you can ask a follow-up question but so a lot of times people i think are trying to give me enough information for you know uh the, the question to make sense but if it's super super long it's really hard to read that in this format so little chunks generic questions really go a long way another thing that helps me is if you see a question in this in the comment section that you also have or you're you've been struggling with or you're interested in the answer to underneath the comment you can like it or love it any of the emotions that facebook allows you to use and they all work the same way for for me which is to effectively upvote that question so as i'm going through and i see a a, a, a question that's too case specific and we can't really field it and i'm churning through the questions then i see one that has eight people like it okay i know there's a demand for that question i'm going to make sure to get it across so that just helps me do my job a little bit better which is of course to serve you so let's get the show started go ahead and start sending in your questions we're going to get to as many as possible as we can today uh dr sumbo i had a question first of all you had mentioned mayo clinic right the the famous mayo clinic and all the different uh uh different um chapters or whatever you want we'll call that the different institutions of that uh, of the mayo clinic and you mentioned the word collaboration and how they collaborate now i know working long enough as i have with this disease that the collaborative effort is imperative amongst doctors amongst institutions even amongst you know provider and patient so talk to me a little bit about why in this disease specifically that collaboration at least am amongst the providers is so important yeah, um, I think that's a great uh, point and a great question because, um, I mean, as a medical oncologist, for example, for me to 
to make a decision of a treatment, like which treatment to use and, and things like that. I mean, I always tell patients with neuroendocrine tumors the first time I meet them, the first question I ask is about, you know, the type of differentiation of the tumor and the grade and all of that. And that's all not based on my read, it's based on the pathologist's read. So you really need a very close relationship with your pathologist. I'm, I mean, I'm with my pathologist on the email or, or phone, you know, almost every single day, kind of asking them questions and clarification, things like that. Same thing with you, you want to be a, you know, very good friend with your radiation oncologist for questions about radiation and nuclear medicine for the PRRT and the surgeons, of course, we all uh, kind of always uh, talk about, uh, you know, these, these cases, because at the end of the day, although when you're meeting your doctor, uh, the neuroendocrine doctor, you know, in the clinic, there's a lot of work in the background where your doctor is probably talking to other doctors and collaborators, uh, you know, in the multidisciplinary aspects uh, to kind of deliver the best care uh, possible, because at the end of the day, we all need each other and we work to, to try to serve the you know, the patient at best. And the same thing, that's the, from the clinical aspects, the same thing with research. Uh, you know, we know neuroendocrine tumors, I mean, the, uh, I mean, they're not really rare in terms of prevalence. And we know that more than uh, at least 160,000 patients are living in the US with them. But the incidence, meaning new cases every year, is, is a small and rare. So that's why we all, uh, when we have a study or a trial or something for research purposes, we have to work with each other as collaborators across institutions uh, in order to get the, the, the good amount of patients uh, enrolled in those trials to try to serve patients at the end of the day. Got it. Thank you very much. Okay, so questions are already rolling in. I'm going to go ahead and start taking some from the audience. Uh, first one comes from Steve, who says, PRRT uh, will not eliminate tumors, but seems to go after smaller pieces of cancer. Is there any research combining PRRT with conventional targeting of tumors? Yeah, so there's a, a lot of work right now. So first of all, for those who are newly diagnosed or not familiar with PRRT, uh, you know, in neuroendocrine tumors, I always tell patients one of the things that are unique about them is that neuroendocrine tumor or cancer cells on the surface, they have like a a receptor, I tell patients like antennas or something like that, like a specific target that's called the somatostatin receptor. So if this is the cell on the surface, they have that. Mm -hmm. um, and you can target that receptor in multiple fashions. One of the ways of targeting it uh, for diagnosis is to inject a dye, the dotatate uh, gallium 68, and goes all over our body, hook up to those cells, and then they would light up and you can see where the cancer is. That's the PET CT dotatate or PET MRI dotatate gallium 68. The other way is to, to use it for treatment. So the somatostatin analogs, such as sandostatin, octuriotide, or lanuriotide, they all work in this way that you inject the patient in the muscle or subcutaneous, and it goes all over the body, hook up to those cancer cells, stop them from growing. I always tell patients somatostatin analog does not, sh they do not shrink the disease. They stabilize it, stop it from progressing and spreading. Now the PRRT is, uh, is a nice and relatively a new uh, uh, kind of concept in terms of the Lutathera, the approved drug, is where you inject intravenously, a drug goes all over the body, hook up to those cancer cells, and then it deliver radiation inside. So it's more like a target radiation. Um, I would say it, it, the nice thing about it that it can shrink the disease. So in about one out of five patients, with small bowel neuroendocrine tumors, it can actually shrink the disease. And then about one out of three patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, it can shrink the disease. It does not eliminate, by eliminate mean, if, if we wanna say cure, it does not cure the disease by itself, but at least it keeps it at bay and it shrink it and it can work for years. Now, a lot of works right now, we have the, the, the lutetium-177, it's already FDA approved. So now a lot of the work is being done is that trying to combine that with targeted therapies, and other therapies like immunotherapies and other things like that. So yes, there, there, there are trials that are ongoing and uh, trying to combine PRRT with, with multiple drugs, multiple targeted uh, you know, drugs, uh, but those are all in a kind of, uh, in a research aspect. So they're not FDA approved yet. Got it, got it. Thank you very much. And thanks for your question, Steve. Next question comes from Patty. If a new cluster of lung nodules along with an, with older stable nodules show up on a CT scan and lung wasn't the primary tumor, what kind of follow-up would you would be recommended? Would you recommend? 
It's a great question. Uh, however, it's, it's it's a little bit uh, tricky to know because it, it all depends on how these lung nodules look like. You know, some lung nodules you talk to that that's where the collaboration is important because I would pick up the phone and call the radiologist and ask them, you know, do they look like a neuroendocrine tumor that's coming up or do they look like, uh, you know, something else like just being in, for example, I speak uh, just uh, being in the Southwest. Uh, we have lots of lung nodules showing up. One of the reasons is, you know, valley fever or things like that. So I think it's it, it really depends. Uh, when in doubt, I think uh, when when your oncologist in doubt, I think it's always important to kind of uh, discuss that in a multidisciplinary fashion, especially especially with radiology and and pulmonary, the lung doctors. Um, sometimes we, you know, when we're you know, there are new nodules showing up. We don't know what they are. We get a, if they are big enough uh, to be picked up on the dotatate scan, we do a PET CT dotatate. If they light up, then that's your answer. That's probably neuroendocrine tumor. Um, if they are not, then there is probably something else going on. And if they're big enough sometimes, and if it can change treatment and, and uh, the management, sometimes we arrange for a biopsy. So it really depends. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Next question from Florian. Uh, can a tumor change its grade to a higher one, even though it's not growing? Um, less likely if it's not growing. Um, I mean, if, if that happened to someone, uh, like let's say, you know, they, they biopsy, then originally it's a grade one uh, with a KS67. Let's, let's say a KS67 is 1%. And then the, your doctor did another biopsy, let's say from the same mass, and it's now 3% KI67. Well, I would say that's more like what we call tumor heterogeneity, meaning that the mass is like this, it's 3D. And you buy in one area, it's going to have a little bit more grade, like higher grade than the other. But to be, for example, well differentiated in a mass, and then you do another biopsy in the same mass and turns into poorly differentiated, it's less likely. Got it. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Florian. Good to see your name, my friend. Um, next question from Mary. What is the standard of care uh, surveillance after GI net surgery? I'm 11 years post net surgery resection of ileum with spread to regional nodes and mesentery. Um, never had elevated blood or urine indicator since that time I've been treated for triple positive breast cancer. My surveillance for nets consists of yearly blood and 24-hour urine tests, which are never elevated. So um, is that normal? Is there anything else that Mary should be should be looking into? It's a great question. Uh, you know, because in this disease, one of the important things about neuroendocrine tumors, another unique thing about them is it's not like uh, colon cancer or breast cancer or something like that, where you tell the patient, you know, five years after the surgery, it's not back then you're cured. Right. Uh, those diseases, because they're slow growing for the most part, they can really actually come back even after five years. And in some cases, rare cases after 10 years. So the, currently the general guidelines and the recommendations, that's what I do in my clinic, is in the in mostly for those patients who had complete resection, meaning the complete the disease was taken out, is to do scans for up to 10 years. And then after, uh, after 10 years, and the scans first in the first 10 years is the scans usually on a yearly fashion and they can go to every other year depending on the grade and, and the risk factors. After 10 years, the recommendation is really to discuss with the patient benefit versus risk of mm -hmm. scans. Uh, so it really depends. I do have patients where I discharge them from the clinic and tell them congratulations, it is less likely to come back. And I do have patients where I'm still following after 10 years. Uh, due to some of their concerns or some concerns that I have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, with higher risk uh, fashion. Um, uh, in terms of the blood work and the urine testing, that's kind of always controversial, but the most recent guidelines, is one of the papers published in JAMA Oncology, was actually recommending against using any tumor marker, if you will, for surveillance or to check if the disease is back or not. But again, I don't know the details, so uh, there might be something that's kind of causing that that to be tested got it thank you next question comes from steven and about 10 other people uh, the liver is often the target of carcinoid cancer metast metastases the number of treatment options is mind-boggling octreotide embolization heat and cryoablation prrt maybe more 
I understand, Stephen. What protocols do you use for evaluating the best options? Yeah, so I think it's that's a great, great question. Uh, it, it's uh, it, what I that my approach, and a lot of us approach it this way, is you kind of you kind of think of it more like a, what we call local regional therapy and then systemic therapies. Okay. So local regional therapies, meaning the therapies that can be done locally on the liver, that includes. It can be surgery, so taking that tumor out from the liver, or it can be uh, embolization, meaning that the re interventional radiologist goes into the blood vessels and try to block the feeding of the tumor, um, if you will, is kind of more like the blood supply. The embolization, that's the concept, can be either with what we call chemoembolization, so that's transarterial chemoembolization, taste is the term. Or it can be a radioembolization, that's tear, transarterial radioembolization, like with what we call, we hear, oh, Y90 and things like that, or with something called bland embolization. And then in addition, so we have surgery, embolization, then we have also something called ablation, which is really technically what, what it means is burning the tumor, either by a very high temperature or very low temperature, what we call cryoablation. Mm -hmm. um, and then in addition to that, under local regional therapy as well, there's what we call external beam radiation, meaning that you're radiating the tumor, putting a high beam of light from the outside. Uh, so that's with the help of radiation oncology. That's all under local regional therapies. And then we have systemic therapies. Those are the, the things that are under my role, you know, in terms of somatostatin analogs, arteriotide, uh, linereotide. And then we have capsidum and temozolomide, oral chemotherapies, PRRT, and, and other things like that. So the decision is where, where to go is really complicated and it requires multidisciplinary discussion you know, between multiple doctors. My approach usually, if you can resect it, then go for it. And, and um, you don't want to hear, uh, especially if you're kind of uh, young or even older, but fit enough to go into surgery. You don't want to hear that you're not a surgical candidate from a general surgeon. You want to hear it from a, actually a neuroendocrine liver surgeon, because we do a lot of surgeries that are kind of more complicated, uh, where patients are told that you're not a surgical candidate. We a lot of times do them. I mean, I just saw a patient yesterday who had his surgery two and a half years ago. Um, he was told it's not a, he's not a surgical candidate, but he had it two and a half years ago here and uh, no evidence of disease. So if, if surgery can be done, that's great. If not, then it, it really depends on the grade stage and all of that. Got it. Thank you for that thorough answer. And thank you for your question, Stephen. Um, okay, so you mentioned octreotide and, and, and lanreotide in that last uh, answer, and we have some questions in that space. Let's take those. Jesse says, is the pill form of octreotide now available? Uh, not yet. It's um, it's kind of being reviewed right now, or or given uh, more like a priority review by the FDA, and it's in in, in trials mm -hmm. right now, but it's not available yet. Okay. Uh, any any thoughts on timeline for that? Um, no. I'm not sure. No, yeah, I okay. don't know. No worries. Uh, from Donald, are there any other treatments for flushing besides octreotide? Um. Beside octreotide, I mean, sometimes the long-acting octreotides, that's the sendostatin, we use that. And sometimes we supplement that by short-acting short -acting octreotide. Of course, equivalent to the long-acting octreotide is the linearotide. Um, the other thing uh, for uh, flushing is sometimes we have patients where their disease is controlled, their symptoms are controlled, but then their flushing get worse because the disease is getting worse. So changing treatment to treating the disease itself, whether PRRT, sometimes improve flushing or other treatments. Um, in addition to that, sometimes we see that the patient, uh, everything was controlled, but now they have worse flushing and one of the liver lesions, for example, increasing in size. That's a great time to send for like embolization, for example, or Y90 or things like that. Got it. Thank you. Uh, from Mary uh, or Mary Norton, are there any medica medications which are contraindicated after a person has had GI nets? It's a great question, Mary. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, it's it's always tricky, and there are things that more like uh, is contraindication as a like a more on paper, and there there are things in right. real life. Like one of the things that 
have been thought to be as contraindication as what we call SSRIs, one of the types of antidepressants. There have been some recent papers suggesting otherwise, but I still tell patients if there is an alternative and you can avoid them, it's better to avoid them. Uh, so those are one of the drugs and it's always important when you undergo a surgery that requires anesthesia that you let the anesthesiologist, uh, the doctor is going to put you under to know that you have neuroendocrine tumor, especially if it's secreting serotonin, because uh, some anesthesia medications actually can provoke uh, carcinoid crisis. And another thing, so carcinoid crisis is more like when they, you have this sudden increase in serotonin in the body that leads to a lot of changes in blood pressure and uh, the hemodynamic of the patient. Uh, so there, there are multiple things. Again, there are things that are feared off and more like on paper and there are things that are real, but it's always, I think, better to be on the kind of safe side. And you have to discuss with your neuroendocrine tumor specialist uh, about the specific drug. A great question. Same yeah. thing for goes for, to follow up on that, same, same thing goes for diet. You know, mm -hmm. some patients uh, ask, well, uh, what are the, the diets that I should, well, diet that, what is the diet that I should stick to and things like that? You know, and one of the things, so the serotonin in the body is actually, uh, is, is really produced because of one of the amino acids called tryptophan. Mm -hmm. And tryptophan can be found in multiple uh, you know, a uh, variety of food, like such as, uh, uh, you know, cheese, uh, chocolate, uh, wine, and things like that. I have patients where they tell me, you know, if I, if I drink wine, I would have an episode. And I have patients who have high volume of disease and they have flushing usually, but cheese and wine and all of that does not cause anything. So right. it really varies. Got it. Thank you. Um, from Skip, my MRI this week showed uh, showed reduction of my small intestines tumor by one third on Lanreotide for 19 months. How common is this? Uh, well, congratulations. That's a great success, Skip. Uh, but uh, it's it's not common, but it can happen. I do have those great. patients. I mean, I, I you just heard me 10 minutes ago saying that does not shrink the disease usually. There's always exception, though. Same right. thing with Afinitor or Everlimus, the pill. We think of it does not shrink disease, but I do have patients in my clinic where it, it can shrink the disease. But if it happens, that's that's great. Great, Skip. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your comment and question. From Jesse, what do you recommend if there is low tumor bulk yet extreme symptoms in carcinoid episodes? And a couple other people have this question. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's, it's a great question because it can be frustrating not to the patient, but also to the doctor. Um, I, I, I think uh, it depends on the symptoms. So if the symptoms are flushing, we have to confirm that it's actually flushing, not something else. Like sometimes even some doctors confused by flushing versus hot flashes and things like that. If it's truly flushing and not controlled by a long acting octreotide and by short acting octreotide, then uh, consideration to actually additional treatment might be considered. For example, now PRRT has been looked at that it actually improves symptoms. So if the patient is eligible for that and uh, the disease is, uh, you know, it makes sense for the disease to be treated with PRRT, then that's one of the options. Uh, for diarrhea though, loose stool, uh, it, it's very tricky, you know, because patients with neuroendocrine tumors can have diarrhea and loose stool for really different reasons. So to try to pin down that reason is very important to know whether it's really from the disease itself or from other aspects. Got it. Thank you. Um, Karen, uh, who is definitely a regular here at the show, says, can you explain what an HIDA scan does? I'm not sure if that acronym is pronounced HIDA or HIDA. Um, do you, and then follow up, do you use this scan for patients with liver disease? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, HIDAC scan is is a scan more like uh, it, it really to to study the gallbladder and uh, to see if there is any problem there in the flow between the gallbladder and the biliary tract. Um, I don't remember the last time I ordered a HIDAC scan. It's more of a scan that's I I'm not aware of a good utility of this scan in in neuroendocrine tumors uh, with the availability of the other scans we have. Sometimes maybe some gastroenterologist, uh, some specific gastroenterologist, they have a question uh, 
you know, whether there is a problem in the flow and that and that biliary tract and, and things like that, then maybe they kind of investigate that. But in general, in neuroendocrine tumors, we don't commonly use these scans. Okay, thank you. Next question from Lynn. Um, if KI-67 can go up uh, or goes up, can treatment cause it to go down? Um, I haven't seen that. Okay. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, no, I don't think I have seen that where, you know, maybe sometimes some variation, you know, it was 10% and you do a biopsy from another side or something like that, you get 8% or something like that. But it's not, I mean, that's not the, really the goal. The goal is, you know, for the, the disease to be controlled and the patient feeling better itself. So I always remind patients, you know, not, not to kind of really focus too much on the numbers. Just mm -hmm. focus on how you're feeling. And uh, if you're feeling fine and the scans look good, then we celebrate. Right on. Thank you. Folks, uh, we are just over halfway done with today's show. Great questions today. We are here with Dr. Basam Sonbo from Mayo Clinic. Uh, like I said, keep those great questions coming. We're going to keep moving on. Um, next question from Sarah and a few others. Is there any recommendation for supporting gut health besides good nutrition with supplements uh, of probiotics for net patients and, and all the gut health issues that we have? Is there anything else that Sarah and patients like her can be doing in terms of supplements, probiotics, something like that? Yeah, I don't have anything uh, specific regarding that. I'm neutral. I mean, I always tell patients the most important thing is when you take supplements, just bring them in and I kind of for me and my pharmacist to look them up, make sure that there's no interaction with your other medications that you're taking uh, just to be on the safe side. But uh, I mean, probiotics specifically, if they wouldn't, if they don't benefit, they probably don't harm. Mm -hmm. um, there, there have been some kind of early studies and things like that regarding how probiotics change what we call the microbiome in the gut, uh, you know, the normal bacteria in the gut. And uh, whether that would improve some of the symptoms or not, it's kind of still debatable, not ready for prime time. But again, I'm, I usually, if I have a patient asking me that, I'll tell them, I mean, I'm not against it, but just let me know what you're taking. Got it. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, and Sarah, you, I'm not sure if you were here at the beginning of the program, but I mentioned this and I'll reiterate it now. Um, if there's a topic in the net field, we have probably covered it for a video, uh, whether on the show uh, which we've done now over a hundred episodes. We've been doing this for over two years or, or in just in the other videos that, that we've done. And we've done uh, quite a few on nutrition. So I would encourage you to, to also use those resources either here on under the videos tab on the Facebook page or on our YouTube channel. Uh, we have talked quite a bit about that and on lunch and the experts, we've had a couple of dietitians and nutritionists on as well. So hopefully that can help. Um, so Michelle has a question about um, lung nets. Which scan, uh, if any, is most effective for atypical lung nets? It's, that's a really great question because uh, when we talk about neuroendocrine tumors, usually um, we have kind of more like a spectrum. So the spectrum is different between where the tumor is coming right. from. So for lung nets or lung neuroendocrine neoplasms, if you will, or neuroendocrine cancers, uh, the spectrum is starts with kind of the slowest growing is what we call typical carcinoid. Mm -hmm. And then kind of the little bit more aggressive is the atypical carcinoid. And then the later on is what we call the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinoma or neck instead of net. Mm -hmm. uh, those that can be small cell or large cell. So with the spectrum, you can imagine the more you're at the beginning of the spectrum, the high, the higher chance that you're, your disease will light up on a dotatate scan mm -hmm. and lower chance to light up on a normal PET CT FDG, which is the uses the radioactive glucose. When you go more with the spectrum with the atypical uh, uh, carcinoid, for example, the, the, there, there you have less patients that have dotatate that's lighting up. So I have, and same thing when you go to the, then to the neck neuroendocrine carcinoma, it's really not common for those tumors to light up on a dotatate. More common for them to light up on the normal PET scan FDG because it's a glucose scan. It's more about metabolism and because they're very fast, they would light up. So to answer your question, for the atypical carcinoid, it really depends. I have patients where they have the 
somatostatin receptors and the dotatate is a great scan for them. And I have patients where they don't have that and I have to use a PET-CT FDG. So that's what we call more like of the functional aspects of the tumor uh, fu or functional scans. Uh, Cross-sectional scans are always good I mean, with, with lung nets. If you're evaluating the lung, CT scan is one of the best scans. Uh, if the lung net is going to the liver, for example, then at that time, either CT scan or MRI of the liver is, is important. So it really depends, but it's a great question. Thank you so much. Uh, next question from Jim and many other people. What is the average amount of time a patient can say can stay on Sando or Lanreotide? After 10 years on them, my body has decided it no longer likes them. Is this normal? Um, it's, uh, it's normal to not like them on the long run because it, they do have some, you know, side effects on the long run. Um, there is nothing like, a, there is nothing like a time limit to how long you can be on them. I do have patients of more than 10 years and they're tolerating. Okay. And I have other patients who within a few months, they don't tolerate well. Uh, the, one of the reasons why on the long run, uh, those, uh, somatostatin analogs, whether octreotide, sendostatin or linareotide they can affect the, uh, they can cause gallstones, mm -hmm. uh, so gallbladder stones. And in addition to that, they can actually cause what we call pancreatic insufficiency. So they can make the pancreas lazy. And the pancreas is responsible, one of the main things it's responsible for is producing enzyme to, to digest the fat. So a lot of times patients would say, oh, you know what? Um, I was fine before, but now whenever I eat, especially when it, it's a meal that has fat in it, you know, ice cream or, or uh, you know, a burger or something. I feel bloated and I have this stool that's kind of a diarrhea type of stool. It's hard to flush and things like that. Um, so, again, they, they do have some side effects on the long run. To answer your question directly, there's not really a time limit and it varies between patients. So, if it's starting to cause you problems and uh, you can always discuss with your doctor and, and the disease is under control. You can always discuss with your doctor whether a break is, is possible or not. Again, I don't know the details, so it all depends. Got it. Understood. Understood. Thank you. Um, from Bridget, is there a connection be between or to carcinoid syndrome and NETS and heart issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question, Bridget. Um, the, the connection is that the neuroendocrine tumors themselves, especially from the small bowel, and uh, they can produce uh, one of the hormones called serotonin. And that serotonin can actually, um, when it's very high in the body, I mean, it's estimated in some uh, research that it, you know, normally in our body, we have serotonin that's produced even before your cancer diagnosis. But after the cancer diagnosis, it's estimated that that serotonin can am be amplified about 60 times at least when you have neuroendocrine tumors that are producing serotonin. Some of those serotonin actually can go to the heart, especially the right heart valves, so the tricuspid and the pulmonary valves, and they can cause problems with them. That's what we call carcinoid heart disease. So that's, that's kind of the connection uh, between the two. And it's very, very important to scream for carcinoid heart disease if the, if the tumor, especially if the tumor is producing serotonin. Um, it, I mean, that's one of the, the things that are really under screened, I mean, under estimated mm -hmm. uh, the, the carcinoid or heart disease, uh, because at the end of the day, unfortunately, that's what can, can be really dangerous for patients. So yeah, it's a great question. Got it. Thank you. And thanks for your question, Bridget. Um, from Azad, what do you think about alpha emitted PRRT uh, treatment? Um, I mean, currently that's all in, uh, in studies. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're all very promising and we do have a study here at Mayo, Arizona. that's going to hopefully open up soon and the next six months or so it's going to open up in other Mayo sites as well. Uh, and I'm very excited about that because that will be, uh, kind of another option to our patients. But uh, again, all of these things are still under research and from the science perspective, they make a lot of sense, but whether it's going to translate into something, uh, you know, useful for patients, we, we will see. And I keep being optimistic because it really makes a lot of sense and it's very promising. Awesome. Thanks for your question. 
Uh, next question from Linda and a few others. When a when is a resection of liver to redu reduce tumor burden not feasible? Uh, there is also tumor burden outside the liver. Following taste and continuing with Everolimus, tumor size has reduced um, many of the tumors, um, but there are still multiple tumors on the liver. So, so when it, when is resection of liver to reduce tumor burden no longer feasible? I mean, it's it's really a great question. Is mm -hmm. it's a little bit tricky to answer it in this specific case because there's a lot of uh, components. But I can tell sure. you in general. Um, I mean, debulking, what we mean by debulking is to mm -hmm. take out some of the disease from the liver with an intention of, uh, of, of trying to relieve some of the symptoms, knowing that you can't take everything out. I, I think that's feasible and that's, uh, that's important. Let's say, for example, if I have a patient where they have multiple liver lesions and one of them is, is a huge thing that's kind of pushing on the stomach and causing them a lot of symptoms, then at that time, talking to the surgeon to see if that's feasible or not, that makes sense at that time. Uh, but again, the, the details of, of knowing for a specific patient is a little bit tricky. Got it. Thank you. Kathleen says, is there any truth to the rumor that there may be a cure for this type of cancer in, in the next two years? Um, I haven't that I haven't heard that, but uh, that would be I would be the happiest person if we can do that. Um, I mean, will there be a cure in the future? Yes. I mean, I believe that. And that's one of the reasons being a medical oncologist is, is you have to be optimistic. Otherwise, you, you, can't, you can't be in, in this field. And I do believe that truly that we do have a, a, you know, a, a promise in the future. But uh, something available in the, two years to, in the next two years to cure the disease and get rid of it completely, um, I haven't heard that or seen any signs of that. Me neither, but thanks for your question. Uh, a few other people were interested in that too. I'm sure all of us are interested in that. Uh, Sarah says, will um, will Merkel or Merkel cell carcinoma show up on scans? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Merkel cell carcinoma is a really a type of a tumor that, that is under the kind of the big, big umbrella of neuroendocrine neoplasms. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of a type of a skin cancer that's extremely rare and it has neuroendocrine features. It can show up on both scans. It can show up on the neuroendocrine uh, scans that dotate gallium 68. Not all of them, but it can. And also it can show on the PET-CT FDG, the, the usual PET scan. Uh, and of course, it depends on how, you know, how spread the disease is, if it's uh, stage four or if it's localized or, 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 or not. It really depends. But uh, yes, it can show up on scans. Got it. Thank you. Next question from Jane. Is Cobalt 55 used in Dotatate PET scans or is this still in trials? I have a Dotatate PET scan coming up with Copper 64, but I was wondering about uh, CO55 since I heard it was 30 times better. Yeah, still in studies. Um, okay. not, not that I'm aware of that it's available commercially. If it's available somewhere, it's probably under a, a study. Um, so not, not available yet. Got it. Thank you. From Reese, I have a primary on the tail of my pancreas that is metastasized in my liver. I've had two rounds of targeted chemo into the liver. Tumors have uh, shrunk. Um, and now we're moving into discussions of removal of the primary. So the question is, what is your opinion uh, of second opinions? Oh, um, that's a great question. I right. always encourage patients for second opinion, especially with this disease. I mean, this is a, again, I, as I said, I mean, it's the incidence, meaning new cases every year are really rare. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for a general oncologist, meaning a, a doctor, not in a tertiary center and more uh, uh, like uh, they, they see a breast cancer and colon cancer and neuroendocrine tumors, on average, really, they might see neuroendocrine tumor once or twice a year, uh, not more than that. Uh, so that's why I think it's very, very important to discuss with your doctor or just kind of reach out to that tertiary center uh, near you to see if there is a neuroendocrine specialist and get a second opinion. 
even, I mean, if, for example, if I have my patient who wants a second opinion, I'm not opposed to that. And you'll see kind of the second opinion in oncology is something that's kind of, uh, I mean, not thrown upon. And some patients have anxiety, them and their family. Oh, will I, you know, will my doctor be upset or something like that? No, they won't be upset. Mm -hmm. If they are going to be upset for second opinion, uh, then that's not the right doctor, I think. For you. I agree. Yeah. Uh, so that's why I think it's very, very important. Um, and it's never wrong to do it. And, and listen, everybody, I mean, the, this sentiment, at least in the net community, I've heard echoed consistently. So uh, I agree with Dr. Sonbol there. I mean, if your doctor has an issue with that in 2022, I think that is an issue. But uh, in the net community, I can speak to that. Like most everyone shares that shares uh, that that perspective. Um, from Stephen, has octreotide ever been considered as preventative after primary GI tumor removal? No, um, it hasn't. That's a great question. That's what we refer to what we call adjuvant therapy, meaning that you had the cancer removed and now uh, should you just observe or do something to reduce the risk of the cancer coming back? It hasn't been shown uh, to do that. Currently, actually in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, same thing, it hasn't been shown and nothing has been shown yet. But one of the important studies uh, that are what we call in the cooperative group. And one of the leaders in this is uh, kind of uh, uh, Dr. Suarez and, and Dr. Hobde and others as well collaborating on this is uh, adjuvant capsidum and temozolomide uh, in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So after the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor is removed for high risk patients, patients can get either placebo, which is usually the usual thing, observation, or capsidum and temozolomide, the uh, oral chemotherapy to try to reduce the risk. That's under a study. So mm -hmm. again, right now, the standard of care is not to do anything and just observe. Got it. Thank you. Folks, we got just a little bit more than 10 minutes left. So keep those questions coming. We're going to keep answering them. Great crowd today. Good numbers. Next question from Linda. What is the best way uh, to screen for carcinoid heart disease? Great question, Linda. I mean, the one of the best ways is... Uh, 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 one of the blood work, it's called the pro BMB that can be screened for, uh, screened with. And in addition to that, uh, the other thing we look for is how the five HIA level are doing. So I, 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 I talked how the serotonin in the body, uh, is there with neuroendocrine tumors. It can be in neuroendocrine tumors when they're producing this, uh, the serotonin, the body gets rid of the serotonin by changing the serotonin to what we call 5-H-I-A-A. And the older way of, uh, of checking for that was with 24-hour urine collection. But now we have a test is actually uh, a little bit more accurate and more convenient, which is a blood test called plasma 5-H-I-A. So I usually check for that and monitor that. So if I see any increase in that uh, or increase in pro -BMB, for example, um, we, we investigate further. And the other thing I do when, whenever a patient has a secretory disease, a disease that produces serotonin, uh, by elevated 5-HIA, um, I check for, uh, almost annual echocardiogram. So every one or every two years echocardiogram, um, there are other things screening and symptoms wise, like if the patient was doing fine and now they have significant fatigue, swelling in the legs, not going away or things like that. We always think about screening. Uh, for carcinogenic heart disease. Got it. Thank you. From Jennifer, do you typically see lung nets return? Uh, yes, they can return. Uh, the, they can return, especially if they're more like an atypical uh, carcinoid. They're a higher risk of returning. Or uh, if there was a lymph node involvement at the beginning of the surgery, in the surgery, that's a higher risk for and uh, for uh, returning. Uh, so yes, they can for sure. Thank you, Jennifer. And actually a second question from Jennifer, does pregnancy and or those hormones associated with pregnancy have any impact uh, on neuroendocrine tumors? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, we really don't know. Uh, I mean, the general answer is that it, probably not. And they don't uh, as a kind of a mechanism between serotonin and then estrogen, progesterone, and all of that. Uh, I'm not aware of any connection and I can't think of any kind of mechanism on the uh, kind of the, the cellular level, but 
um, I, to be honest with you, uh, we don't know. Right. Thank you. Um, from Dwayne, I had my peanuts ablated uh, at Mayo Rochester, and I've never seen this uh, as a treatment option. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, it's under what we call local regional therapies. As I discussed, there is multiple aspects. Uh, one of them is to burn the tumor with an ablation. So that is one of the options for sure. For peanuts specifically? Uh, for uh, for peanuts, it can be whether okay. in the liver or even uh, in highly selected cases cases for the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor for the primary in the pancreas, it can be done as well. Got but it. it has to be specific size and it has to be uh, that the relationship with the blood vessels surrounding it is very important. So it really requires... Uh, uh, you know, an, an endoscopist. So a gastroenterology mm -hmm. doctor with endoscopy specialty mm -hmm. and very advanced endoscopist to do that. Copy that. Thank you. Carrie says, if a tumor was found and removed from the, from the bronchial tube, but pathology still shows cancer cells present in the lung wall, would a sleeve lobectomy uh, be recommended? <laughs> Um, a lot of times when you have a resection and that it's believed that the resection is what we call margins are positive, mm -hmm. uh, there is always a multidisciplinary discussion whether, you know, doing another surgery or doing additional therapies is useful or not. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's a great question, but unfortunately, I can't really answer that question is it really needs to dig into the details of the pathology and the details of the case itself. Got it. Thank you. From Rebecca, can your grade change from low to medium or high? Yes. Yes, it can. Um, and um, it can go from well-differentiated, the well-behaved ones, to the poorly dif differentiated, poorly behaved ones. That's, uh, that's rare, but it can happen. Um, and that's why when I have a patient and they, for example, they haven't had a biopsy or assessment of their grade in more than like five years or so, I almost always try to biopsy again to see where to see where we're at, or if I have a patient who have low grade net and now the disease is uh, significantly increasing in size, which does not make sense, then I would biopsy again to make sure that it's not transforming into the poorly differentiated. So it's, it's a great question. Got it. Thank you. Uh, next question from Ursula. I've had four rounds of chemo, six rounds of PRRT, uh, inoperable due to spread from pancreas to liver to the right ovary, and I'm experiencing good shrinkage, and I've had three lanreotide injections while awaiting final PET scan. Most of the tumors are in the liver area. What shrinkage must I have to be operable? Um, there is not really... It's, it's a great question because there's not really a magic, uh, you know, number. Mm -hmm. um, it's a case by case and depending on the surgeon expertise. So uh, there's not like a, a saying, oh, 50% shrinkage or, you know, um, going down three centimeter or four centimeter or something like that. It's, uh, it's all about time and expertise of the surgeon. Um, I tell patients, for example, it's not a good time to do a surgery when the cancer is increasing in size. Uh, because at that time you don't want to do surgery because if you do a surgery and then a few months after it's going to increase or show itself in other areas, the best time to do surgery is as you described or consider surgery as you described. I mean, things are shrinking or stabilizing. Now it's the time to kind of consider or think about discussing that. Understood. Thank you. Uh, from Karen, what does it mean if the resected tumor had lymphovascular and neural involvement? Um, if, if it has lymphovascular involvement uh, or lymphovascular invasion. Uh, it, so those are one of the, the things what we call the kind of high risk features. When we do a resection of the cancer itself, the pathologists look under the microscope. They look at multiple things. They look at the margins, meaning the safe space surrounding the cancer itself. If it's, uh, if it's normal or if involved by the cancer cells themselves. And they look at the very, very small blood vessels and the small nerves in there. So if the small blood vessels are involved, that's what we call, they call lymphovascular invasion. If the small nerves are involved, that's what we call sometimes, uh, you know, kind of more like a nerve inv invasion in, in that, that area or p &I. Uh, But uh, those are all more like what we call microscopic risk factors. They are associated with a high risk of the cancer coming back, but 
would they change change management? Most of the times they wouldn't change anything. Got it. Thank you, folks. We got five minutes left. We're going to try to get to a few more questions while we have time. John says, have you heard of or heard when the octreotide daily injection supply shortages will be corrected? Um, yeah, I haven't heard anything. Um, fortunately, we're hit with many shortages and holes. And have you, I mean, the community is probably aware of the recent hold of the PRRT, but now we're back on. Uh, but I'm not sure about the uh, octreotide. Got it. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, from Donald, is a tumor growing at a pace of one centimeter in three months considered slow growing? Or the bigger question is, what what is considered slow growing, if, if so or if not? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 it depends on the grade. If you tell me it's a grade two and it went up by a centimeter, I would tell you, yeah, I mean, it makes sense if the KS6, 7, 18% or something like that. Yeah, it, it can. If, if you tell me the KS6 of less than 1% and it's growing one centimeter, maybe it's a little bit faster than what we see, uh, but it really varies. Um, and it depends where it's growing as well. Um, here's a good general question from Rebecca. What is exactly is the difference between sandostatin and lanreotide? There, it's a great question because we get that a lot. And yeah, it's, right. it's, it's really, I tell patients that are exactly the same. It's, it's different companies and mm -hmm. just, just the way they're injected. Uh, you know, the, the lanreotide is given deep subcutaneous. Um, and then the, the sandostatin is given intramuscular. Um, it gets a little bit tricky with sandostatin. Sometimes you do want a nurse who's familiar with the injection. Sometimes it gets a little bit tricky to inject it. Um, lanuriotide is a little bit easier. So a lot of times if I have patients who are working with local oncologists in kind of a remote area that they don't have a lot of support, I try to work with their oncologist to use lanuriotide instead, just because the nursing staff might not be familiar in that area with uh, octreotide or sendostatin injection. Um, but at the end of the day, in terms of side effects, effectiveness, how effective it is and all of that, it's, it's really the same. Um, even like there was an interesting study they looked at, it was presented recently in last year where they looked at and surveyed patients in terms of uh, pain and symptoms and things like that. And they were exactly the same thing uh, in, in terms of uh, those other things. Got it. Got it. Effie says, uh, showed up late and still learned something new. Uh, we love to we love to hear that, even if you're here late. And uh, don't forget, you can watch the replay. And Dorothy says, it's good to see younger doctors like Dr. Sonbo. It always gives us hope. I, I love that too. And actually, uh, Dorothy, that's part of what we try to do here at the foundation is, is, is showcase a lot of experts in the field. And she also says rain is his usual loving self. That means so much to me. You make me cry, Dorothy. Thank you. Uh, so last question, advice to a new patient. We've had a few people who are new to this disease. We know that you may, may or may not have ever heard of this. They might be confused, scared. What do you tell that person who just got diagnosed last week with the neuroendocrine tumor? Um, I, I think first of all, you know, you're not alone, as you can see, although it's rare tumor, but we have a great community in the neuroendocrine community. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's never wrong to get second opinion and not, not never wrong. You should get a second opinion if right. you're not seen by a neuroendocrine specialist. Um, and your doctor can always work with that neuroendocrine specialist and collaborate with each other. Um, this is a completely different animal, you know, the neuroendocrine tumor. It's not like a colon cancer or breast cancer, or cancer and all of that. And most patients really do well and uh, whether get cured or even live with the disease for years. And I, I tell patients, I do have patients who were diagnosed two decades ago with stage four disease. They're still living with the disease. So it's incredible. that's why you'll be fine. Incredible. Well, Dr. Sombo, I appreciate you being here. We're, we'll send you a lot of these comments here at the end of the show. So many people were flooding in saying how informative uh, today's show was specifically and how much they learn. Thank you for sharing your time and experience and knowledge with us. We appreciate you being here today. Thank you for the invitation. It's, it's a pleasure.
Absolutely. Uh, and thank you all at home as well for joining us. Uh, as always, we hope this program helped to answer some of your questions. And I'll reiterate one more time, reach out to CCF if you have any follow-up questions here uh, on their Facebook page or at carsonoid.org. And also, as soon as this video is done, it will post itself on the Facebook page and you can always access it or replay it or send it to someone else who wasn't here. And starting Monday, we will put it uh, on YouTube for those who don't have uh, Facebook. So you can always watch the replay. Thanks again to our presenting sponsor, Ipsen Biopharmaceuticals. We couldn't do this show without them. And finally, my name is Rain Bennett. I am your host and I, I got to give a shout out to my wife, am headed out tomorrow morning to go see two of the best soccer clubs, football clubs of all time play in Green Bay. We have Manchester City from England and Bayern Munich from Germany. An amazing 40th birthday present that I got. So I'm headed to Green Bay bright and early tomorrow morning to watch a football match. And I'll be thinking of you all. Have a great weekend. Stay healthy. Stay safe, everyone. And join us next time on Lunch with the Experts. Bye-bye now.